Hello, and welcome to my channel. My name is Jonathan Cohn, and on today's video, I have a review of the 1999 epic fantasy novel debut of Elizabeth Hayden titled Rhapsody. This is the first book in the Rhapsody series. From what I can tell from my research, it looks like uh, Rhapsody, uh, it was an original trilogy, and then it had uh, two trilogies that were written afterwards. One that was written pretty, pretty quickly afterwards, and then one that was written a few years later. So there's three trilogies. I own the first trilogy, which includes the book Rhapsody. It also includes the book Prophecy and Destiny, which I just love the covers on these books. I just, I just love them. And that's why I bought them, because I love the covers. And I was like, I'll see if the books have as, are as good as their covers. And so I read the first book, Rhapsody, the shortest of the, the trilogy, and I just have to say, I loved this book. I was wowed by it. I it's such a thematically dense book, and I just I just ate it up. I read it so fast. But I have to put out a warning. I think that most other people will not like the book. I, I want to warn that I don't necessarily recommend this book to everyone because I think most people will have major problems with the book, despite the fact that I absolutely unequivocally love the book. So uh, it's going to be a very interesting review here because I'm going to try to explain why you won't like the book, but also explain why I loved it and also why I think it's, it has merits in the fantasy genre. Um, uh, so it's going to be a, a tough, tough needle to thread. Um, uh, one of the things I will talk about in this review is the various themes. There are some very deep themes about morality, about sexuality, about prostitution, about um, uh, about governance and the role of government. There are deep themes about the role of religion and religious leaders. There's also themes about um, uh, individual morality versus collective morality. There's themes about friendship in here that there are very dense and that are very uncomfortable for a lot of people to read. I would put I I have an I have an analogy for how I think this. Uh, I, how I think the themes of this book are for, for most people. I would say this book is kind of like getting a colonoscopy in some ways that when you, you do not like the initial process, you think it is going to be painful. It is going to be, it, it, it grosses you out. It's icky, but afterwards you see the merit and the value that that experience had. And you think this is a good thing. And that's how I view this book. There are several things that if I just told you what those things are, you're going to say, nope, I'm out. This is not for me. But when you read to the book's completion, you understand why the book was saying these things, why the book introduced those themes, and you'll say, okay, I think that has merit. And that's how I, I view the book. Because there is something in the prologue of the book that I know will just cause many readers to say, I'm out. I am not reading this book. Uh, it, it's something sexual that happens in the prologue. And I was disturbed by it. But if you continue on, you will see where the author is going. And I think she has some good comments about society that are worth, worth, worth addressing. So that gross analogy, it's over. Won't, won't go back there, but I will talk about the themes. But I want to start talking about the characters. As you can tell on the cover, which I love this cover, it is by someone named Royo. I'm not sure who that is, but they do a great job with cover art. It's got three main characters. You have Rhapsody, you have Grunther, and then you also have Ahmed. Uh, my favorite character in the book was Grunther. Oh my, did he make me laugh throughout the book. Usually the big brute who is like the, 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 the sidekick character usually has that element of is the comic relief, has a humor good nature. Like he's, he's a big, giant, furbolg character, and yet he's just so lovable. And you just, you just, you just love hanging around with him. And that's how I felt with him. I think that that's a trope that a lot of fantasy uses. And I think this is one of the best examples of that. He just, every time he was on the page, I just smile. He's just, he's just such a lovable character. And yet he's so like, when he gets in a battle mode, he's just like going at it. He's just bloody everything. And then he's all sweet. Oh, talking, talking to Rhapsody. He's just, he's just a sweetheart. Um, and then you have the character of Rhapsody. I think Rhapsody will get on a lot of people, under a lot of people's skin because she has a lot of elements that are very tropey slash cliche and also are very exaggerated. 
Um, uh, she has a very checkered past. I, I don't know how to, um, how to say it more cleanly for YouTube, but let's just say she uh, was in a not-so-respectable profession. And yet the author writes her in this sense of purity in that she has, she has mu very much changed since her past. And she has this new outlook on life that is just so refreshing in a fantasy character. And she has this attitude when she sees children. She just has this sweet, good-naturedly, motherly tone towards them. She's very much trying to do the right thing to help people out, trying to be the nice, a nice person. Uh, and yet, when she gets into an action scene, whoo boy, is she kicking butt everywhere. She, she is a pretty good action hero. And then also there is a transformation where at one point in the book, she's a very beautiful woman. And then a transformation happens and she's like described as like the most beautiful woman ever. And many people will probably roll their eyes at that. And there it is admittedly a little cheesy the way it's written. But the, what makes this book so good is what the author does with that. All of these characters are commenting on her beauty and she doesn't realize the transformation has happened. And yet she is still so kind towards others, yet she is still so willing to, um, uh, to, to help others out. Uh, and yet if you mess with her, Ooh boy, you're going to be, you're going to be sorry. Uh, she, she, she can handle herself on this book. And so I really liked a lot of her character and I'll talk more about that when I talk about the themes in a second. And then we have the third of the main characters, Ahmed, who is really quiet at the beginning. He has some funny moments, but he's pretty quiet for the first half of the book. And then he basically reveals his personal goal about halfway through the book. And once he reveals his personal goal, he becomes very talkative and he is just going towards that goal. And I liked it because it had an element of Machiavellian power struggle, kind of a la um, uh, like the prince or the 48 Laws of Power, he had that kind of a tone towards him of, I am going to achieve this power. But yet he is still intending to use his power to help the people that he's trying to help. So it is interesting where you have a character where you're like, mm, you are really power hungry, but I have to support you because you probably are the best choice in this case. So he's an interesting character, although he can be so rude sometimes. There are just sometimes, um, like, just, just be nice, man. Um, uh, uh, at the beginning, I thought, ooh, maybe I'll ship him in a, a Rhapsody. By the end, I was like, no, you are too, you are a rude man. I do not like you. Uh, and then there's some other great characters. There's a character who shows up partway through named Ash, who I saw some reviewers didn't like him. I thought he was a delightful addition to the cast, and I enjoyed every page that he was on. Um, uh, he... He was delightful. He, he was very socially awkward, and so things were happening, and he didn't realize they were happening. And also, he would just say what was on his mind. And, oh, oh man, was it funny. He, he had some funny moments. Uh, and then uh, we also had uh, the character of Joe, who I didn't love, but I thought was pretty entertaining because she's, she's a character I'm not meant to like but is meant to be valuable to the story, and she definitely is. And then the final character I liked was Lauron. I think that's how probably you pronounce it. Um, uh, I pronounce it like Lauron, like Sauron. But Lauron was an interesting character because he's a member of the clergy. And he is um, a, a, the, written the way I think that the clergy need to be written in more stories. So often, the clergy, pa priests, pastors, whatever you the clergy... They're portrayed in such a negative light. They're portrayed as hypocrites. They're portrayed as corrupt. They're portrayed as evil. They're portrayed as power hungry. All this stuff. And this is the way that you write a member of the clergy who is a legitimate, kind individual trying to help out society, trying to spread whatever their beliefs are. And I really liked the way that he was written. And I'll talk about more of that in my theme section when I get there. So those were the characters I thought. And quickly talking about the world building and the style and the plot. This is where the book probably is going to be most mixed for some people, but it worked for me. This book, for sure, for absolute sure, is influenced by the Wheel of Time. There were specific scenes where I said, oh, that was, that was a, there, there are, there are scenes that I thought 
we're referencing the Eye of the World, the Great Hunt, the Shadow Rising. Um, uh, there, they, they, I was just like, it has to be a reference there. There's also some things that I'm like, eh, pro- she probably took from Lord of the Rings, not Wheel of Time. But there are certainly some things that had to be Wheel of Time reference. I mean, just just could not. Um, uh, which I'm okay with because she took a, her own very unique – the spin in the way that she tells this story is very unique. And I uh, – she it's the way where she blends the familiar with the, with, with the, with the unique. Um, uh, she takes something that is tried and true and put, put, puts her own version of it out, which I really liked. And so uh, I thought the world building was great because of that. This is, for one, a very different style world. Normally, you just have a single landmass that everything takes place on. The first half of the book takes place on an island. The second half takes place on the landmass. And the way the two are interacting is really interesting. Also, the way that history works, this is a very historically dense book. You know, there's, there are info dumps about history that I liked. You know, if you, if you like in the Sword of Shannara or really any of the Shannara books, there will just be moments where the old wise character is basically just imparting all of this knowledge about the world and, 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 and its history. Uh, this, this happens a little bit in Wheel of Time, but it really happens a lot in Shannara. Uh, that, is, that happens for a really long time. This is probably the most I've ever read it in a single novel. Uh, that happens a lot in here, and I liked it. By the way, be careful reading some of the summaries because some of the summaries in this book give away some of the spoilers about the book, I think. Um, there's a spoiler about how the book unfolds halfway through. And on the back of this book, it's it's on there. And I was like, why would you do that? Why, why, why would you spoil the best reveal in the book? On the, on the back cover. So just be careful when you're reading stuff. So anyway, but uh, I, I quite enjoyed the world building. The plot is essentially in three parts, two small parts and one big part. The first small part is about the first hundred pages. Uh, and it's an action scene that's, it, you got the prologue and then an extended action sequence. Then you have about a hundred pages of journey. And I promise that this is, is going to be hard to read but it's worth it because of what happens after the journey. After the journey through something, the characters end up in a new place and the overarching where the story's going happens and when they get there. And it's about page 200 or so that this happens and it goes to the end of the book, six, page 600 something. So it's like 400 pages of good stuff. And that ending, that, that second half of the book was just superb. And... I really like the way that the clergy is used here, the themes are used here, and everything. The themes are used really well in parts one and two, but everything comes together in this second part. So if you can get past this this journey that's in there, it's, it's I think, worth it. But I think most people will still not get there. So uh, I'll talk about themes for a moment. And uh, just note, this is my interpretation of the themes you might read this book and get other interpretations, uh, but I think I think this is this is valid uh, based off my reading of the book. Uh, they are very difficult to talk about on BookTube because of the nature of the the, the controversy and also just the nature of what they're dealing with. Um, particularly, probably the most hard hitting one is the one that has to do with sexuality. Um, uh, there are themes about what happens to the main character when she is deflowered, let's say. And uh, uh, the author makes a point about the idea of long-term relationships and the idea of when you should be involved in... It's very very difficult to talk about. But the author handles it very heavily. Like, you're you're very much, like, going to be, like, feel the theme being used, but I think it is a, she is addressing it in a way that many of her uh, fellow authors, particularly male counterparts, I think don't write it as well. Um, uh, I think that Hayden writes this better than say the wheel of time handles this topic or than say, uh, uh, Shannara or anything else. I think that this is one of the best, most deft handles of it. This also, this theme extends to the idea of prostitution 
and of the way that uh, uh, it's used and how men uh, subjugate women through this, there is an ample discussion about the problems of how fallen we are and the way that we treat other people. And I really appreciated where she was going with this uh, because this is something where you could be on two sides of the aisle on the two extremes uh, and actually, I think, like where she is, where she ends up, but you will neither side will like the way that she gets there with this. Um, but I really liked the, where, where she was going with that. But it's a hard read because of the things that happen to the character and the things that are said in the book. Um, uh, but I still think they're very, it's very valuable and it's what makes this book work for me and probably won't work for you. Also, there's discussion of governance. A certain character in this book uh, uh, decides to pursue, Ahmed decides to pursue some sort of political power. And when he does that, it is very, very interesting, the discussion there. I really like the discussion about what constitutes good government. Um, uh, how do you run a government? And then this leads to another theme of taxation, specifically on tariffs. You think, oh, I'm just going to read a fun fantasy book, but you're going to get a lesson in free trade in one of the chapters. And it's written in such a way that you're really involved and you don't realize when you're reading, oh man, this is like a textbook Example of this discussion of free trade versus fair trade versus tariffs versus non-tariffs. It is an excellent discussion. Like if I could – the problem is there's stuff said in that chapter that you can't, you can't use in schools because there's, there's some not, not nice words used. But if you could take the discussion, the ideas presented in that chapter and teach them, they're very much the dis great discussions about free trade um, that I really liked. And it applies – Perfectly. It doesn't feel like the author was just like, I'm going to talk about free trade. No, it was that necessary and valuable to the book and to the characters. Uh, and so I really like the way that the trade was talked about. Uh, there's also a discussion of religion. And as I mentioned, uh, there is a discussion of what is the value of prayer? What is the value of works versus faith alone? What is the value of the clergy? What is the value of the church? Should the church have its own power structure outside the government? Should the government have involvement in church power? It's a very uh, complex discussion. And it's not, uh, whereas the sexuality prostitution stuff is hit head on in the book, whereas the... Uh, the, the clergy stuff is more back burner. It's more in the corner. But it's still so uh, such a valuable discussion uh, that I really liked because she attacks it from very – attacks all angles. And she's very – she has a way, way that she ends up with what, what her argument is, but it still, ha it still addresses everything, which I really liked. Um, uh, they, I will say one thing I didn't like about the book – there is an element of the world building about something between dragons and humans. When I read this, I was like, ew, that is gross, that is horrible, I do not like that, get that out of my books. Ugh, I did not like that. So, there is one element that I really didn't like that rubbed me the wrong way, that was that, that one world building thing, which I guess you could figure it out based off my tone here, but ugh, it was, it was terrible. Uh, but it's not a big part of the book, and it, I can overlook it for everything else that I liked about the book. So, in general, I loved this book. I absolutely loved it. I will for sure be reading on to books two and three this year. I, I, I'm, I'm hooked. I have not felt like – when I finished, like I was just like, I'm just going to keep reading a little bit, see where it goes. I got to the point where I just couldn't put it down and I was like – I almost considered – I set out my TBR, which has gone, already gone out. I considered like should I just go into the next book? I was that excited. I have not felt – this excited for a series since I read Brandon Sanderson's The Cosmere and the um, the uh, and also the uh, Brand, uh, the Rune Lord series by David Farland. I I felt really excited and I was like I'm gonna go read all the books. And that's how I felt then. I have not had that. Mm, I gotta read everything now, and I have that with this. But again, I will restate my caveat at the end. I believe that most people who read this book are going to dislike it. But I'm okay being in the minority on this one because it just worked for me. Uh, you know, when you, when you go to Goodreads to look at this, 
the book has a fairly good, it has like almost a 4.0 um, rating, which is fine. It's not um, stellar, but it's not bad. It's, it's actually quite, quite fine rating. But when you go to the reviews, so many of the reviews are like two stars. There's one stars in there, some two stars, maybe some three stars, but the reviews are very much lower end. And I think that's because people are like, have very strong opinions and they want to write about it. But I think you might enjoy it, but probably most people aren't going to like it as much as me. But I just loved it. It just worked for me. And oh, I'm so excited. It's in my top 10 series already just from the first book, but I don't know where to put it until I read books two and three, which I have and will be reading. So if you've read this book, let me know your thoughts and comments in the comment section down below. Are you interested based off what I said? Or are you just like, nope, I am I am not reading that thing. I don't want to go anywhere near that. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section down below. But, oh, this is going to be an interesting dis discussion. Uh, the comment section on this one's going to be interesting. So thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe to the channel where I have lots of fantasy discussions. And until next time, I'm Jonathan, and thank you for watching.